Hello, everyone. Welcome back to freepilotgroundschool.ca. This is our fourth lesson of on uh, flight operations. We're going to be discussing performance charts. If you recall, we started uh, the first three lessons on flight operations uh, before you wrote your PSTAR test. Now uh, we're moving along with your flight training. You're hopefully doing quite a bit of flying and you are thinking about uh, your takeoff and landing distances and other uh, sorts of things going through your pilot operating handbook looking for uh, performance information. So let's get started. Start with, we'll uh, work our way through the takeoff performance charts. So if you uh, have a pilot operating handbook, if you, for let's say a Cessna 150, if you wanna open it up and follow along, that would be great. All uh, Cessna uh, takeoff charts look pretty much similar to the chart that you see here. So for 172, it's going to be pretty similar. So first thing that you need to be aware of, there are conditions for takeoff charts, okay? So flaps up, in this case, full throttle prior to brake release, paved level dry runway, zero winds. Then there's also uh, some notes, so the maximum performance technique. Uh, so you would wanna look in uh, section four, and then uh, above 5,000 feet, lean the mixture. And then it talks about headwinds and tailwinds. And, uh, and then uh, operation from dry runways. So this is pretty easy to use. It's going to assume that we're always at gross weight of 1600 pounds. So that will be most conservative, obviously, if you're over gross weight, which you never should be, um, but it, it won't work. And, uh, and then we just take a look at our, our altitude. So let's say we're at 3000 feet, okay? And it's 10 degrees out, okay? Ground roll is 935, and the distance to clear 50 of obstacle is 1,780. Then of course, uh, if you have a dry runway, just take a look at the note here. So it tells you to add 15% to the ground roll figure. And then um, it's, it's important to note that for this ground roll figure, you would only add it to this. So let's say 15% of 935 is going to be approximately 140, uh, just a rough guess. And then what you would do is you just add 140 feet to this number over a 50 foot obstacle. Cause obviously once you're clear of the grass, there's no longer any drag on it and, and you're back to normal. And then here for the headwind and tailwind, 10% for each nine knots headwind and uh, a 10% uh, increased distance is 10% for each two knots of a tailwind. So tailwind makes a big difference. This is a crosswind chart. Uh, you can figure this out if you're mathematically inclined using uh, sine and cosine ratios. But we got a chart which is kind of nice. So let's just say the wind is 50 degrees off the runway at 30 knots. So 50 degrees, that's this line right here. Okay, and 30 knots we said. Okay, so that's this arc. So that's going to be right here. So we go down to here and then over. Okay, so we're looking here, the crosswind component, 23 knots, the headwind component is 19 knots. There's something called the Canadian Runway Friction Index. Uh, you're pretty much never gonna use it in a small aircraft and even on a large aircraft, they're kind of moving away from it because they found the variability is just so much. Like if you look at your dry snow on pavement is anywhere between 0 0.76 and 0 0.16. So you can imagine uh, it's gonna be anywhere in between there. And even if it's being measured, it might change rapidly. And so what it ends up happening is let's just say they measure it and it's like 0 0.7, you're like, oh, that's great. But then by the time you actually land, like 15 minutes later, it's like 0 0.3, which is going to, let's say, double your landing distance. So it's, to be honest, it's not really the most um, precise uh, chart. So people are kind of moving away from it, but you should know that it exists. It just uh, gives you a, a friction index for different types of contaminants on the runway. We have dry snow uh, on packed snow, dry snow on ice, dry snow on pavement, so on. We'll uh, look at the next slide here, how we apply this. So then what happens is you would take a look at the crosswind component um, and let's just say and the runway friction index so if if you saw that the runway friction index is let's say 0.3 okay so that's 0.3 the maximum crosswind component that you should use is 10 knots so it's pretty simple and then you just kind of use the the crosswind table and and look at these maximums so it basically works out for five knots for every 0.5 uh, 
um, starting at uh, 0.2, but that's, that's going to be pretty rare. Here's some cruise charts for the Cessna 150. We have both a time, fuel, and distance to climb chart and a cruise performance uh, chart on the right. So again, a pretty simple, take a look at your conditions on both of them, okay? And then you, let's say if you wanna figure out the time to climb. So let's say you're climbing to 4,000 feet, okay? The average temperature here is seven degrees. Okay, tells you that you should be climbing at 65 uh, knots. Tells you you're gonna have 510 feet per minute rate of climb. And then here from sea level, okay, this is important. I'll get that in a minute. It's gonna take you seven minutes, use one gallon of fuel, and you're gonna fly eight miles, assuming that you have no wind. Now, let's say you don't start from sea level. Let's say you start from 1,000 feet. The runway is at 1,000 feet, okay? So we take a look at these and then we just subtract them, okay? So one minus 0.2, so that would be time would be 0 0.8. Uh, sorry, 7.2 is five. Sorry, I looked at the wrong one. Okay, five. And then one minus 0 0.2 is 0 0.8. That's the fuel used. And the distance eight minus two is six miles. So that's how you figure that out. Now, if we want to take a look at the cruise performance chart, over on the right side, we look at the uh, pressure altitude and the RPM we're gonna be flying at. So let's say we're at 4,000 feet and 2,400 RPM. Then we just go across. So let's say it's standard temperature. So we'll just take a look. So what it says here is we're at 2,400 RPM, we're developing 54% power. We're gonna be doing 91 knots, true airspeed, and burning 4.1 gallons an hour. The other thing that's important, you can interpolate between these two. So you're going four and 6,000. Let's say you're going to 5,000. You just go and it's same 2,400 RPM. Doesn't make much of a difference. 90 to 91 knots, sure, let's call it 90 knots. And then 3.9 gallons, 4.1 gallons, four gallons an hour. The fuel burn charts in Cessnas are the same as the cruise chart. So like the example that we just gave, 2,400 RPM at 4,000 feet, and the fuel burn, 4.1 gallons per hour. Now keep in mind that's recommended lean mixture. It's very important that you are aware that that's when you lean the mixture. Also that is in cruise flight. That doesn't include any takeoffs and landings. And so typically flight training uh, will take, uh, the fuel burn will be considerably higher because you are taking off and landing and climbing sometimes half the time, okay? but this is cruise only, so you're in level flight at 4,000 feet. Remember, to climb there, you have to figure this out right here too. So you can see how much more fuel burn it is. Here it says seven minutes, and it's gonna burn one gallon at 4,000 feet. Okay, so that's a full power, seven gallons. That's like nine and a half gallons per hour you're burning in the climb. So nine and a half gallons an hour, and then here's 4.1. So if you're, um, climbing half the time like you are sometimes when you're doing flight training uh, you're constantly climbing up to an altitude to do stalls or spins you might end up burning seven gallons an hour in this airplane because you're constantly climbing up and up and down here's just a bit of a zoomed in here version but here let's say 2000 feet 2400 rpm 57 percent brake horsepower you're doing 91 knots and burning 4.3 gallons per hour and then again the climb let's say you're going to 2000 feet only 2,000 feet, takes three minutes, burns half a gallon of fuel, and it's gonna be four miles. Let's look at a landing chart now. So same thing as the, the takeoff distance, you should be able to figure it out. Uh, remember it's important, the conditions. So flat 40, power off, maximum braking, paved level dry one way, zero wind. Uh, the notes gives you maximum performance technique. So take a look in section four, just make sure that you're familiar with that technique. Decreased distance is 10% for each nine knots of headwind. So the same as for the takeoff. And then here, dry grass runway. So same thing, increase distances by 45% for the ground roll figure. So in that case, let's say we're landing at 2000 feet and it's 10 degrees out. So the ground roll is 470 feet. The total distance to clear a 50 foot obstacle is 1115. So if we're adding the ground roll figure 45% to this 470, uh, that would be about uh, two, 
let's call that 220. I think that's about right. So we're adding 220 to that. So that's going to be 690. And then we add only 220 to the other one. So that will be 1335 approximately. If you have a calculator and I screwed up the, the math in my head, uh, forgive me. But uh, that's how you would figure that out. Let's talk about some performance speeds, also called V speeds. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about VSO is the stall speed dirty that's going to be right here. Okay, that's the, actually, I should make that white so it's a bit more obvious. Okay, that's going to be the stall speed with the landing gear and the flaps all the way down. Our next speed is VS1. Okay, that's going to be at the bottom of this green arc. That's the stall speed, the clean stall speed, so flapping gear up. Next, we have our top of the white arc, VFE. So that's a maximum flap extension speed. Uh, so you, you risk damaging the aircraft if you are above that um, above this speed when you put the flaps out. VNO right here, the yellow one. So the end of the green, beginning of the yellow, it's the maximum speed you want to be flying in normal operation. And then of course you have your VNE, which is your never exceeds the red line. Don't want to go past that. There is also a, a maneuvering speed, VA, which we covered earlier. This is the speed that you're going to fly in turbulence. And uh, it's the st uh, stall speed at the maximum load factor. VX is the best angle of climb, which works out to approximately the minimum drag speed. It's not on the airspeed indicator. And VY is the best rate of climb, where your lift drag ratio uh, is the best or is approximately the best. So this should be pretty obvious. What are the effects of contaminants on the runway? So you have a contaminated runway. You have snow, ice, grass, whatever. Well, it should be pretty obvious, but it increases the distances. So that means it decreases the performance. A dry grass runway, a relatively short grass, will increase the distance by 15% uh, for takeoff. Other surfaces are unknown. It's very difficult to quantify saying, okay, well, one inch of snow will increase it by this much and three inches of snow will be that much. So it's just something to be aware of if you're flying on unprepared surfaces. You do need to, you actually always should be prepared to abort the takeoff if you're not at a certain speed um, where, you, where you can't reject the takeoff safely anymore. Uh, but it's especially important if you're on a contaminated uh, runway. So here's a airport somewhere in the Alps. You can see it's really downhill. This is a one-way strip. A 1% upslope decreases the landing distance by 5%. So that's uh, quite a bit. You do need to be aware of the illusions, though. An upslope runway make it look like you're too high. So the result is that you have a low approach. And a downslope runway makes it look like you're too low. The result is a high approach. So if you just take a look at these visual ang um, uh, cues here, how it would look like an upslope. So you can imagine it on a normal slope on the top one with an upslope. But it looks like you're way too high. So what you'll actually end up doing is being a bit low. And then the opposite for the uh, downslope runway. The other thing you'll find on uh, downslope runways too, sometimes you'll land on a downslope runway, you'll be in the flare and you just end up floating for a long, long distance because you're kind of coming down slowly, but the runway is dropping off underneath you slowly. And so it's very easy to end up uh, landing much longer than you were anticipating on a downslope runway. All performance charts make certain assumptions. If you're operating in conditions that are not part of the assumptions, you don't have accurate data. Performance numbers are based on a new aircraft, but average pilot skill. An upslope runway makes it look like you're too high. The tendency is to be low on approach. And a downslope runway makes it look like you're too low. The tendency will be that you are too high. Okay, let's work our way through a sample question. What is the estimated distance to clear a 50 foot obstacle for an aircraft at 2,500 feet at 10 degrees departing a grass runway? So let's start 2,500 feet, that's halfway between 2,000 and 3,000, and it's 10 degrees, so it's right here. So I'm just gonna underline these two. Okay, so it's gonna be the average of 935 and 855. So when I take that average, I end up with a ground run of 895 feet. Okay. And I'm departing a grass runway. So what does it say? Oh, 
grass runway, 15% of the ground roll figure. So I'm using a calculator for this. So it's times 0.15. So that's going to be 134 feet extra. Okay. Now I'll look at the average of 1615 and 1780. So I end up with 16, normally it would be 1698. Okay, feet, that's declared 50 foot obstacle. I add the 134 feet, which is the, the uh, increased distance of 15% of the ground rule figure. So plus 134, I end up with 1832 feet. So the correct answer, C, 1,832 feet. You're departing runway 22. Tower reports the wind is 160 at 25. What is the crosswind and headwind component? So remember, runway 22 is a heading of 220 degrees magnetic, and the tower reporting the wind is 160 degrees magnetic. So remember, normally in weather reports, it's in true, but when the tower calls it, it is in magnetic. So the difference between that is 60 degrees off the runway at 25 knots. So let's look, 60, here's 60, and 25 knots, be about here. Okay, so we're right here, and over. So I would say the crosswind component is going to be 22 knots, and the headwind component's about 12 knots. Make turn 12, so we'll call it A. That's the correct answer. This one's a trick question. What is the ground rule at 1,000 feet uh, elevation, zero degrees Celsius? The runway is covered with snow. So remember, it is always based on a paved level dry runway. There is a note for a grass dry runway, but nothing for snow. So it's not, we are unable to determine this. My last question, what risk is there in landing on an upslope runway? So let's just say we're on an upslope runway. We're coming in to land. See how steep that's going to end up looking? So we'll end up being, unfortunately, too low. So the correct answer is B, you're approaching too low. That concludes this lesson on performance charts. I think it would be a good idea just to keep in your books, grab your pilot operating handbook and just work your way through uh, some problems and just get really familiar with how to use them. You will need to use uh, know this for your flight test as well as your written test and when you're flying normally. We'll see you in our next lesson.